All right. This is KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. I'm Jess Nam. And this is Jamal Dejani. We have uh, quite an interesting show today. We're going to be doing a live interview with Jamal in uh, on the East Coast right now. Jamal is actually in, um, let's see, Boston. Boston, Massachusetts, exactly. But through the... Uh, fantastic elements of uh, technology and everything. We're able to do the whole show. Um, and we're also brought uh, live streaming on Facebook Live at Jamal Dejani too, as well as uh, we're, we're going full steam ahead in the studio here live in San Francisco. Well, Jamal, we might as well jump right into it. We, we definitely don't have enough time today to cover the, the breaking news that's happening within the last 24 hours. I'm just going to give the highlights, and then we're going we're gonna to dive in. Breaking news number one, Benjamin Netanyahu indicted today uh, by the attorney general, the Israeli attorney general, for basically bribery and corruption. Item number two, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State for the United States, has reversed 40 years of uh, American foreign policy and decades of international human law and basically made it U.S. foreign policy that U.S. illegal, uh, that illegal U, uh, Israeli settlements are no longer considered illegal by American standards. Third item, the uh, uh, Israeli military has been doing bombs, uh, bombing raids inside Syria right now and uh, violating uh, basically the sovereignty of another country. And then the fourth item, which is kind of wrapped up in the first two, is that Benny Gantz was unable to form uh, a government uh, sending the Israeli uh, political, uh, basically, uh, establishment into chaos. Fifth item, if we have time, which I don't think we will, unfortunately, is that uh, the impeachment probe continues to go full steam ahead with some very um, devastating uh, uh, testimony from witnesses in the last two days. So, Jamal, I think, I don't know what you think, but I think we should talk about the the settlements first because that's kind of a huge deal that hasn't received any attention so far in the U.S. media to speak of. That's right. Uh, as you know, in a, uh, on Monday, in a basically a surprise, really, announcement by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, that the United States views Israeli settlements, and I'm not I'm quoting here, as not inconsistent with international law, which is totally false, and we'll talk about that. And, uh, of course, we should not have been surprised for anyone who, ha who has been following the Trump administration and its pro-Netanyahu and anti-Palestinian stance since inception. Right. So so even though we were surprised, but at the same time, I don't think people should be surprised because every single uh, decision that this administration has uh, taken has been anti-Palestinian and pro-extremist, uh, pretty much Likudnik position on the Israeli side. Think about it just the minute Netanyahu, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Trump comes into office. He starts talking about his deal of the century. Well, guess what? Now we know what's that deal of the century yes. is all about. Really right. ending basically any rights that, that the Palestinians have and uh, when it comes to forming their own state, when it, it comes to their own civil rights, when it comes to uh, getting rid of those illegal settlements. And by the way, and I started by saying that this was totally false, all what you have to do, all that, just look at the uh, Gene Fourth Geneva Convention, which basically very clear about not only the settlements, but also the transfer of population, both ways. Transferring indigenous populations outside their own land, and also the transfer of other populations, meaning in, in, case, in, in time of war, you cannot also transfer your own population to occupied territory. So the Geneva Convention is very clear about this. All United Nations agreements uh, are very clear about this. And yet, 
we are so used to the, 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 the Trump administration making false statements and right. twisting their right. own basically words and saying, oh, by the way, every single, single administration that was against the settlement uh, movement is wrong. And now we're changing the rule of the game and we're, we're moving the goalposts for the Palestinians. Like, I don't know how many hoops Palestinians have to jump through right, right. to the have any rights under... Uh, Trump, basically, and Netanyahu. Well, I think it's also important to put this in the uh, context of a couple of things, Jamal, which are very disturbing, obviously. One big context is that this, this uh, announcement by Mike Pompeo came in the context of the impeachment hearings. So it was completely buried underneath all of the other news that was going on. So that's number one. Number two, I think it's important to understand that this is also occurring at the time when the Israeli political establishment is in utter chaos. And it seems to be a move to prop up Benjamin Netanyahu. Third point, you know, we've been saying this, Jamal, for, you know, 20 years now, maybe longer. But couldn't this ironically be a statement in favor of the one-state solution in some kind of weird, twisted way? Well, I act, I've actually tweeted uh, almost immediately after that announcement, and I've said, basically, what Pompeo is doing is advocating for a one-state solution, but under apartheid governance. Right. So, so right. yes... I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, this is what's going on anyways. You don't, you don't have to make that statement. Israel wants the land, but it doesn't want the people of the land. And, and, and if they're stuck with the Palestinians, they're just going to keep them as second and third class citizens in this country, take over control all, all over the land, not grant them any rights. And so we do have a de facto one state, you know, because the land from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River is 100% under Israeli control. Let's not kid ourselves, including Gaza, which is the largest open-air prison. So Gaza, in this formula, is just a prison. And then the rest, Israel controls uh, the West Bank. It controls a, a, all the areas, Area C included, which is the la largest part of the West Bank. It, it, it controls Jerusalem, East and West Jerusalem. Right. So what's really left, nothing is left. Few Palestinian enclaves under the Palestinian Authority who are basically uh, working on behalf of the Israelis to protect these illegal settlers and uh, just to keep these Palestinians under control. You know, this is what uh, both the Trump administration and the Netanyahu administration won. Yeah, I think that's right, Jamal. And uh, in another surprise move, Benjamin Netanyahu, just prior to his uh, announcement of being um, indicted, announced that he may also take steps to annex the Jordan Valley part of Palestine. So uh, it seems like Netanyahu is not only wanting to further alienate the, in the international community Every single Palestinian, every single, you know, basically person in the Middle East, every European country, the, the, the world of nations, he's alienating everyone. But one of only two Arab countries that have a so-called peace deal with him, he's taking steps to annex the Jordan Valley in addition. Um, am I missing something or is the... The, the, the kind of Zionist fantasies that have been going on for over 100 years now are trying to be realized under this political chaos that we're having here in the United States, as well as the political chaos among the Israeli establishment. Well, I think that both Netanyahu and Trump are feeding of each other. They both believe that their survival is dependent on each other, it's dependent on the uh, far-right votes, both in Israel and this country, or voters, both in this uh, in the United States and this country. They are. Uh, that's. This is basically their audience, and uh, Trump has been basically implementing every single item on the Netanyahu agenda. Right. You know, 
the uh, the move uh, moving the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's Netanyahu's agenda. The annexation of the Golan Heights, which we talked about it many times, that's on the Netanyahu agenda. The legalization and legitimization of the settlement, the settlers, basically, that's on the Netanyahu's Netanyahu's agenda. And I believe that Trump thinks by uh, delivering on Netanyahu's dreams, he will get the votes right here in the United States because he's counting on the... Uh, I don't know who... I, evangel I evangelical Christians or I, uh, otherwise called sure. Zionist Christians in this country. I think it's... Because a, that's also part of their agenda. Right. And then uh, deliver the vote for him. And Netanyahu, he goes back and tells the settlers, which basically form his largest block in uh, Israel, saying, look... This is what I've been able to achieve. We've annexed the Golan Heights, we've annexed Jerusalem, the West Bank is going to be annexed soon, and that's what's keeping him alive. In a way, uh, we talk about his indictment, and he got indicted, uh, uh, Jess, but also, even within that indictment, you know, indicted for fraud and corruption, uh, other things. Bribery. Corruption. Yeah. But I tell you one thing, uh, he was indicted on charges of bribery, fraud, breach of trust. Basically, those are the main the main indictments. But in a way, he won. And do you know why he won? I don't see how because he won. Be yeah. He won because he managed to get the uh, to get the courts to indict him while he is prime minister, and while he still enjoys a lot of immunities. I, I don't know if um, that's going to go very far, Jamal, to be honest with you. I really think that um, the idea that this is going to benefit Netanyahu in any way is, uh, is a stretch, only because he was unable to form a government. Gantz is unable to form a government. This means that the Israeli electorate is going through, is going to have a third election coming up probably sometime at before the end of the year, at a time when President Trump is even more weakened, the idea that Netanyahu benefits in any way of this net-net, it seems like the only benefit that he might get is that uh, he, as a standing prime minister, cannot go to jail yet. But, you know, we shall see, right? It, I want to ask you one question about, um, about this. We had talked last time about uh, Avigdor Lieberman maybe cutting a deal with Benny Gantz. I guess that didn't happen. It didn't happen, Jess, and uh, actually going to a third election will be the last resort. So there are several steps before this. There is uh, 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 actually the members of the Knesset can vote for an interim prime minister, which will be a big loss for Netanyahu because they can vote for an interim prime minister pending having an election. Also, uh, Netanyahu and Gantz can reach an agreement to go back to form the coalition government they weren't able to form before. Right. Uh, so they might, uh, you know, exchange terms, you know, Netanyahu staying in office for two more years and then Gantz came uh, coming into office, we've seen this scenario before between uh, uh, Shamir and Paris in uh, in Israel. So they can uh, basically have two years and two years, and uh, Netanyahu will kind of stay out of jail, let's put it this way, for another two years. I think it's, uh, and also, by the way, he is the first uh, uh, prime minister in, in Israel to be indicted while uh, serving his term. That's right. You know, if you remember uh, uh, Olmert, uh, who uh, who was indicted, he was indicted after. I mean, the investigation started during his term, and then he got indicted after he left. That's office. right. That's no. why he served served term. No, that's uh, right. Because of this, and that's what Netanyahu is trying to avoid. He's playing all these all these games. I mean, you know, Netanyahu is seven years old, just. 
and he he is the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. The longest serving. Imagine that. Yeah, but but as I said, Jamal, I think that uh, you know things are so fluid right now. Whatever calculation Netanyahu made uh, to get to this point at this time. All bets are going to be off because things are very fluid. Avigdor Lieberman, who continues to be the kingmaker, will will not do a deal with Benjamin Netanyahu. The the Israeli populace, we we have to remember, you know, there's it's not that they're really divided, but at the same time, you know, with the bombing of innocent civilians in Gaza and then now the bombings in Syria of refugee camps of innocent civilians. It looks like 40 plus, you know, civilians were killed by the Israeli military going into Syria, you know, breaching the sovereignty of another country. Um, It seems like there's a lot of there's a lot of unease and chaos. As I said, you're going to have to give me a sense based on your read of the Israeli media, whether or not the Israelis have an appetite. Historically, they've had they do have an appetite for war. But with a war on the Syrian front, with unsteadiness on the Lebanese front, with creating these difficulties with their so-called peace neighbor in Jordan, as well as the difficulties with Donald Trump, do you really see this benefiting Netanyahu? Well, listen, anything benefits Netanyahu to create a distraction. So obviously we know the recent bombing and attack on uh, an assassination targeting uh, members of the Islamic Jihad, then the attack on Gaza and killing over 35 people in Gaza, the attack on the attack on jur- uh, journalists. Uh, recently, we've had a journalist who was shot in the eye. All these things play to his favor. And I've actually posted something about this, and this is something that's really unique to the Israeli uh, uh, population. And I said, this is a country that where you can indict a sitting prime minister or a president, because remember also they have the former president Katz. Uh, he served time in jail for uh, sexual rape, abuse. Really. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For rape. So I said, this is a country where you can indict a sitting prime minister for bribery, for sexual harassment, for rape, for fraud, you name it. But idealize them at the same time right. for killing Palestinians, for ethnic cleansing, and for implementing apartheid. So, so, and, and I got a lot of comments from Israelis about this. And some of the comments actually were positive. Yeah. But it is very true. When it comes to the occupation, to the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, to all the war crimes that has been uh, that have been going on for the past seven years, most Israelis are willing to bury their heads in the sand and pretend that they did not happen, or the extremist ones will forgive you. That's right. For, for, you'll give you for on these crimes. Maybe they'll, like I said, they'll indict you for fraud but they will not dare to challenge you to say that, you know what, you were behind the bombing of Gaza, which resulted in the death of, you know, so many children, or you were behind the extrajudicial assassinations and the extrajudicial killings, or the construction of illegal settlements or the stealing of Palestinian land. They're willing to kind of look the other way and turn a blind eye. And this is really amazing. And I mean, and I don't want to generalize because, of course, uh, there is a few minority who have been uh, speaking against it and siding, you know, and, and, and basically standing uh, behind uh, Palestinians in their struggle right there in Israel and right here in the United States, like members of Jewish Voice for Peace. But I see it the same way, actually, the same uh, way it is mirrored right here by organizations like APAC and others who are willing to lecture about certain things. and But when it comes to Israel committing war crimes, they are not willing to take a stand or they just instead, just like even look, look what happened with our own democratic candidates. 
when Gazans were slaughtered, more than 30 were slaughtered, then what do you hear from our democratic political candidates? We hear statements like, Israel has the right to defend itself, instead of taking a you know, stance, a humanitarian stance, saying enough with the killing of the children, they make, they, they, they just parrot the uh, apex talking points. That's right. And I ask them all, whenever are they willing to say that Palestinians have the right to defend the, themselves or Palestinians have the right to survive? We're speaking with uh, Jamal Dejani, a co-host of uh, Arab Talk, live from uh, a location in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, this is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. We're at kpoo.com at 89.5 FM. We're broadcasting live. I could see that our listeners on Facebook Live are very engaged, Jamal, you know. Um, I, I want to I bring up, there, there's kind of a backstory here that's really worth talking about. And, and that backstory has to do with your friend Mike Pompeo, the current Secretary of State. Now, Mike Pompeo has been receiving a lot of heat from the State Department for his cowardice and his failure to back up and to support all of the career diplomats in the State Department who've put their careers on the line by calling out the bribery and the illegality of what Trump did with President Zelensky uh, from Ukraine. So you, 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 we've been talking about this. Every day he attacks these career diplomats. He questions their fidelity to the United States. He calls them traitors. All these horrible things. And so this is our State Department, rightly or wrongly. You would expect the head of the State Department, Mike Pompeo, as the Secretary of State, to defend these individuals. He has not. He's become roundly criticized. Number two... Just as, just as a footnote, you know that Mike Pompeo has recently told three prominent Republicans that he plans to resign from the Trump administration. Well, that's, that's, that's what I'm... Run for the U.S. Senate right. uh, and that, in Kansas. And that's what I'm kind of getting at, Jamal. That's exactly the point. He's on his way out of Secretary of State. Yesterday, um, Ambassador Gordon Sondland basically threw Monk Mike Pompeo under the bus along with Vice President Pence and Mick Mulvaney and basically said, hey, listen, this was not a rogue, uh, you know, a rogue uh, attack or a rogue effort. Everybody knew that we were shaking down the president of the Ukraine, including Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, and everybody else. So Pompeo's credibility is sinking faster than, in, than uh, anything right now. You're right. He's leaking out balloons that... He wants to get out of being Secretary of State, run for the Senate in Kansas. So my point to you, Jamal, what better gift to APAC, what better gift to the money that APAC has at its disposal and supporters that it has at its disposal to promote candidates in the Senate than to give them this gift of reversing 40 years of U.S. policy on the illegal settlement colonies uh, in Palestine. I think this was a calculated move on his part. I think he's on his way out, and this is his way of saying to AIPAC, hey, I'm running for Senate, and I need your help. Well, you're absolutely right. I just want also to be clear that AIPAC does not directly fund uh, candidates. Of course, they recommend uh, they recommend. They recommend candidates and what they donors. and they find donors, you know, as we know. Yeah, yeah, because that's something like APAC usually tries to get defensive. They try to beat you on this technicality. We don't try checks. Absolutely, they don't try the checks, but they direct the funds through all their campaigns and all their promotions, etc. Telling people go behind or or, or uh, you know support this candidate. And yes. I have to say, all these people, Pompeo, et al., etc., they are all trying to win their brownie points on the backs of Palestinians, in this case, to appeal to the uh, evangelists, to appeal to, appeal to uh, 
you know, certain voters who want to support Israel and uh, and basically get elected. And he, for his short, short term, when he leaves, the damage will be done, even though, I mean, like I've heard his statement, for example, talking about how it's not true that the United States and he, he kind of like uh, uh, skips... Uh, Presidents and he goes and says, uh, "Well, during the Reagan administration, uh, right. the position was, you know, the Reagan administration did not question the, legit, the legitimacy of the settlements." And hey, by the way, during the Reagan administration, we did not have the Oslo Accords, for example. Right. Right. And the, the United States did not recognize the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. But anyway, he somehow was cherry picking right uh, the moments in history and failed to mention that uh, for example during the republican administrations president president uh, george h w bush denied israel 10 billion dollars in housing loan guarantees right because right. of its settlement construction and which he deemed illegal so there was a clear position, not only by, uh, you know, he, not by demo democratic administrations, but also by re like Republican administration, including George W. Bush, saying time and time again that settlements are illegal. Well, that's exactly right, Jamal. And I think, um, you know, we want we 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 also want to be an equal opportunity critic because even after this. Uh, outrageous uh, change in U.S. policy, which flies in the face of international law, and I should say the rest of the world, about these illegal colonies in, in occupied Palestine, we have not heard anything from the Democratic presidential candidates. We've heard nothing essentially from the Democrats about this, and isn't it convenient about the timing that there is this uh, deafening silence. And I would say the main people who've been thrown under the bus during this last 24 hours, not Donald Trump, not Mike Pompeo, but it's really the Palestinians, yet again, who've been thrown under the bus by the U.S. government. So where are the so-called progressive elements or any elements in the Democratic Party to come up and say something that what this administration has done is is contrary to the interests not only of this country but to the entire world. It's been deafening the silence. The closest one who came to a statement was uh, Bernie Sanders. And what did he uh, say? And, and sadly, well, he has been always a critic to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he has also said that the uh, billions of dollars of aid to Israel, some of that, some of this money should be diverted to to rebuild Gaza. And uh, you know, he has been very uh, critical, uh, you know, about Israel's human rights abuses and so forth. The rest, you know, like Warren remained silent, but ev but everyone else, including <laughs> including Biden, said that Israel has you know has the right to defend itself when they're obviously seeing with their own eyes. And Biden, who served as vice president under the Obama administration, which by the way, Netanyahu humiliated not once but more than once including coming to speak in front of a joint session of congress you know when he did not invite him and uh, basically thumbed his nose at, at obama meaning he also thumbed his nose at joe biden because he's, he was his vp yet again he just like succumbs to the apac marching talking points and performs on their behalf. It's kind of ridiculous. Yes. And, and at the same time, one thing I have to tell you, because I was at a meeting in Oakland, in Alameda, before I came to Boston here, and there was a uh, someone reporting on behalf of a delegation, uh, I guess, at a conference in Southern California for the Democratic Party. And he came and spoke, and he said, you know, the issue of Palestine was front and center to this, you know, part of the discussion of uh, a delegation from the Democratic Party saying this is nonsense that 
most of the delegates were leaning towards the left, or at least to the center. None of them wanted these kind of right uh, positions that uh, the Democratic Party, and as you know, uh, this issue came up uh, last during, time, uh, the last elections, 2016. And, uh, they kind of Right. Yes, and, and basically they just ignored that the position of this country, especially the left part of the Democratic Party, is against occupation, is against apartheid, is against ethnic cleansing. So, so Jamal, not, so I'm glad you brought that up because I'm sorry to say this yet again, but the Democrats are foolish enough to throw Palestinians and the issue of Palestine under the bus yet again, the only thing that this will do is alienate large segments of the energized Democratic Party and increase the probability yet again of someone like Donald Trump or Donald Trump directly being reelected again. So the Democrats, Jamal, are shooting themselves in the foot again. They've just taken yet another step to alienating the large segment of their base. And I hate to say this, but this is going to support my prediction that this is going to increase the chances of Donald Trump being reelected. Exactly, exactly. And, and this, is, this is exactly what happened last time. That's by right. By throwing Bernie Sanders under the bus, by ignoring the wishes of the new democratic movement within the party and moving to, you know, they like to use the word to the center, which is, I don't think it's to the center, it's really to the right, right, you know, of the yeah, party. Yeah, it's to the right. But that, but that, their positions don't satisfy the thirst of those extremist elements in the Republican Party or the Conservative, so they're not going to satisfy them, they're trying to appease to them. Yet, and they, and they disenfranchise the young people. They again. The, the people with vision. Again. So they do the same thing again with someone like, uh, voting for someone like Biden. Yes, Trump is not indicted or pushed to resign or what have you, where, you know. Uh, he will win again. He will win so again. They, so, so, I don't know when they're going to get it in their thick skull that there is a major shift. You have a new blood, you have AOC, you have uh, Rashida Tlaib, you have others who are taking a whole different approach, a whole different attitude towards the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. People who are, you know, you cannot be basically be a hypocrite and say, I want to, you know, stand with the people demonstrating in Iran and stand with the people demonstrating in Hong Kong, but it's fine to kill Palestinians when they demonstrate. It's fine to target Palestinian journalists in the eye when they when they demonstrate peacefully. Where's, this is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. We're broadcasting live from studio in San Francisco and streaming and speaking with Arab Talk co-host Jamal Dejani live from uh, Boston. And we're live streaming on Facebook Live at uh, Jamal Dejani too. Well, Jamal, you know, it seems like the Democrats again have lost their courage. It seems like a, it seems like again the Democrats are more interested in serving the interests of APAC and a foreign country than serving the interests of this country, but also serving the electorate. Uh, let's be clear about this, Jamal. It's just not fringe elements in the Democratic Party to the left that support Palestine. It's the majority of Democrats who support Palestinian dignity, self-determination, uh, who know that the settlements are illegal, not just under international law, but just under general sense of morality. So Democrats, if you don't get your act together, if you don't listen to what people are saying, if you feel controlled by APAC yet again this year, you're going to lose the presidency yet again, and we're, we're going to have another four years of craziness in the White House. Um, Jamal, I think we should 
Oh, there's one other thing that was buried, and I think you heard about this, but I don't know if you, you didn't. There was a uh, piece that came out in the New York Times talking about Arab intellectuals finally coming together and wanting to engage Israel. This came out today, Jamal. Did you see that article? I think. I didn't. Oh. Why don't you tell us about it, Jess? Well, it's kind of disturbing, Jamal. They, there's this interesting disinformation campaign. A small group of so-called Arab intellectuals who are tired of boycotting Israel are saying, rather than boycott Israel, maybe we need to do something differently and engage with Israel. And I want you to see if you can guess who was leading this. It's a very famous name of the person who was the headliner who was spearheading this effort. And where do you think the funding came from? Well, the funding would be easy. <laughs> where it came from? It came from Saudi Arabia. So the funding for this international conference of Arab thinkers, they didn't even call them intellectuals, because obviously they're not. Arab thinkers coming together to rethink engagement with the Israelis. So the money came from uh, Saudi Arabia. The headline speaker is Anwar Sadat III, who is coming out of the woodwork, uh, and I'm sure his father is turning over in his grave right now, but was the, one of the lead speakers in this panel of about 20 people. And by the way, Jamal, included, surprise, surprise, no Palestinians um, to lead this and, and reform. Let, let, me tell you let me tell you something. If you ask uh, Egyptians, all uh, 90 million of them, most of them, they'll tell you they haven't heard anything from this uh, Anwar Sadat III. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but but don't you think it's interesting, all of these things, the timing of all these things? I mean, it seems like Saudi Arabia and, and, and the UAE are, are, and of course, MBS and MBZ, are part of this concerted effort to, to basically support the ethnic cleansing and the political ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and the Palestinian issue by putting on this show and sham panel discussion and how the BDS movement doesn't serve Palestinians, when in fact we know that the BDS movement, Jamal, is unequivocally the most successful uh, political movement in the history of Palestinian self-determination and continues in its non-violent political struggle, like South Africa, Jamal, to be the biggest threat to the Israeli uh, brutality being engaged against the Palestinians right now. And yet they want to come out right now, Jamal, in the Arab world to talk about how they need to re rethink engagement. So we have to thank the Saudis. We have to thank the Emirates. We have to thank uh, Anwar Sadat III, who I, this is the first, when was the last time you heard from Anwar Sadat III? Never, never. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my but, point. But, you know, you know, just I'm not surprised. And actually, this reminds me of uh, the time after the first Intifada. So whenever Palestinians uh, achieve or, uh, certain victories, I would say minor even victories, uh, on the international level, uh, you know, with the first Intifada, which was a grassroots movement, a peaceful uh, people saying no more to the no more occupation. Right. We're not going to be your enslaved by uh, Israel's labor force. We're not gonna report to work. We're not gonna open our shops. And millions and millions of people across the globe were watching the Israelis brutalizing these peaceful demonstrators. They've concocted a plan. And the plan was Oslo. This was basically, it was this whole, you know, now, you know, when we spoke about this, people used to say, oh, you're being a conspiracy theorist. But this was the whole plan to get rid of basically peaceful Palestinian 
uh, march to freedom right. by uh, outflanking them and, and running and bringing the uh, uh, PLO all the way from Tun- Tunisia uh, when when Israel was, was supposed to negotiate with the Palestinians uh, basically on the land. Right. Talk about, you know, giving them rights and whatever. So they created this whole myth about, oh, we're going to have a two-state solution. And now look, all those people who are applauding the two-state solution, including the United States, they're all abandoning it. Right. And they're all turning, you know, making up all kinds of stories not to recognize uh, the uh, basically what was in the agreement, saying, you know, yeah, settlements are legal now. You know, when, when settlements were like one of the first items that were pent down uh, as a result of the Oslo Agreement. So when Palestinians were, you know, making headway, those people who, who conspired before are conspiring again because now Palestinians are making headway, headways through another peaceful movement, which is modeled after the boycott uh, of apartheid South Africa. That's right. It's a, peaceful, it's a peaceful movement. And actually, a lot of people don't understand that actually BDS, uh, it even doesn't take it all the way because uh, BDS uh, only calls for the boycott of products from Israeli settlements, not from Israel itself. That's right. And initially, Benjamin Netanyahu himself dismissed the BDS, said that this is just a gimmick, and then later on turned around and called it an existential threat. Well, they, he called it around an existential threat. This is a term only used for Iran and so forth. And that's why we're seeing even legislators in this country illegally violating the Constitution, trying to draft laws to penalize people who support the BDS movement. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It it's is. not only that Israel is going after those people who want to buy cut uh, its products, but we have people who have sworn an oath to the U.S. Constitution to really, they are violating the U.S. Con- Constitution and the First Amendment. And we're seeing it. Yeah, that's right, Jamal. Right? So we're observing it today. So, so to me, when you tell me they're now trying to create a another think tank, you know, another, what I call it, stupid tank, not a think tank. It's a stupid Palestinians tank. Palestinians don't need a think tank. Palestinians need a do tank. And that's what they're doing. Jamal, I, I think I want to formally thank uh, Secretary of State Pompeo for his support for the one-state solution, something you and I have been advocating for decades now. It just seems like the U.S. foreign policy, which is what we've been talking about today, for those who joined us uh, a little late today on Arab Talk, we're talking about the 40-year reversal United States policy saying now that the illegal colonies that uh, colonial outposts that the Israelis have established in occupied Palestine basically are no longer illegal. And um, uh, of course, this goes against international law. It goes against the entire world of nations. It goes against United Nation uh, resolutions from the Security Council as well as from the General Assembly. So, Mike Pompeo, you may go down in history not just as the worst Secretary of State, not just as the most duplicitous Secretary of State, but you may go down in history as the Secretary of State who facilitated the the march toward the one-state solution. Thank you, Mike Pompeo. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. We're also uh, going to thank our viewers on on Facebook Live who have been watching us uh, and who have been loyal every time we uh, are on the air, basically. So, Jamal, we only have a few minutes left, and, um, you know, a lot can happen in two days in the impeachment hearings. It seems like um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who was the NSC, uh, one of the NSC representatives who was in on the call when President Trump on July 25th, 2019, was shaking down uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine. He gave incredible testimony. We had Ambassador Sondland 
the hotelier from Portland, Oregon, who basically bought his way to be the ambassador to the uh, European Union, gave explosive testimony, basically saying none of this was a rogue. There was a quid pro quo. Donald Trump did shake people down. Everybody knew about it. Trump knew about, Trump directed it. Mike Pence knew about it. Mike Pompeo knew about it. Mick Mulvaney knew about it. Everybody knew about it. Rudy Giuliani was driving this. And yes, there was uh, the, the Ukrainians had $400 million in military aid held up uh, as a way to extort them or to bribe them into doing something like opening up a false investigation that has been discredited on a potential opponent, uh, Joe Biden and his son Hunter, uh, in the 2020 election. I don't know how much, because I know you've been traveling a lot lately, but really in the last couple of days, there has been an extraordinary amount of information coming out that has not, that has not been hearsay, according to the Republicans. We're talking about direct eyewitness accounts uh, confirming and verifying that this shakedown, this bribery, this conditional uh, uh, conditioning U.S. foreign aid to the personal interests of the President of the United States, in fact, occurred, Jamal. Now, you and I have been maybe struggling a little bit about whether or not, I mean, I think we both believe that he will be impeached. I'm still not convinced that he's going to be removed in the Senate, even after this explosive uh, eyewitness accounts of the treachery, basically, and bribery that the President of the United States engaged in. That's right, but let me listen. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bittman. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and the attacks that he was subjected to. Uh, number one, uh, all the respect uh, goes to him. Uh, I, along with probably millions of people, believe every single word that he said. Absolutely. Uh, he conducted himself with honor. Uh, he has served his country. And to me, just, I mean, listen, we know there was a quid pro quo. Listen to all these different testimonies. Uh, they can uh, try to spin it any which way they, they can. But what's disgusting, and I use the word disgusting, is how some members of the media, and of course and, and their supporters and uh, politicians who have been attacking the patriotism, patriotism of right. Lieutenant Colonel Bittman, trying to kind of say, well, because he's a naturalized U.S. citizen born in the former Soviet Union, that he had some dual loyalty. And I'm talking about here specifically on things that I've seen on Fox News right. and other outlets. Right. In the uh, there was a segment that ran. An episode of the Ingram Angels, right, which first aired on October 28th, uh, which was broadcast on the eve of uh, uh, Colonel Whitman's uh, testimony uh, when he was uh, first deposed. And then a transcript of his deposition was released to the public two, day, two weeks later. Right. And I'm quoting here, and this is what was said in the air, Jess, and, and you could see how they have been spinning it. And then they, they uh, this is on this program saying, here we have a U.S. national security official who is advising Ukraine while working inside the White House, apparently against the president's interests, and usually they spoke in English. This is conservative commentator and lawyer Laura Ingram said during the broadcast. And then she continues, isn't that kind of an interesting angle on the story? Right? And then... She has another guest who kind of picks on this and said, I find that astounding. And then some people might call that espionage. So so this, I watched this on this program. You watched yes. it? Oh, really? You yes, watched? I did. Wow. I watched it on, the, actually, I didn't watch it live, but I watched it on uh, a, uh, a YouTube, uh, which had it. And then the, people have to 
people have to really watch it and people have to watch it to understand what they were trying to do what they were trying to do they were trying to say that because you know his uh, family came fled the soviet union but he actually his loyalty wasn't with the united states but rather with other parties so they are really trying to say that he was you know that they had a an espionage uh, segment basically in it right so i was very happy today to read uh, in the news that army lieutenant colonel uh, alexander vitman has asked fox news to retract and correct reporting uh, and i i think that he has been uh, an officer and a gentleman because <laughs> he should really go and sue them immediately yes. and not ask them to retract because this is really disgusting they're tarnishing his reputation someone who has served someone with a purple heart and i don't know what else uh, that he received as far as uh, awards and so on but to say that just because he wasn't born in this country that he was a traitor that's what they were saying yeah and i think that's uh you know that's not so um veiled anti-semitism or an anti-semitic attack on lieutenant uh colonel vinman too which you know shouldn't go without uh, saying this so-called idea that somehow there's a dual loyalty in the vinman family you know lieutenant colonel vinman is a twin his brother served in the military they have a third brother who also served in the military and so this idea of co- somehow attacking him for being disloyal i i agree with you completely and by the way one of the witnesses today fiona hill who was born in the united kingdom also came out and said that she was disgusted with the attacks on the on Cur- on lieutenant colonel vinman challenging somehow his uh his fidelity to this country his patriotism because he wasn't born here it's it's a it's a pretty vicious vicious attack hey jamal we got a looks like we got a come to another close today of arab talk you've been listening to arab talk with justin jamal here at kpoo in san francisco we're at 89.5 fm you can listen to this show and any other show you want by going to our website arabtalkradio.com where you could listen or watch all of the podcasts check us out on facebook live at jamal dejani too check us out on twitter and where else jamal can people find what's going on youtube, with youtube youtube got our website arab talk radio we, we have all of our uh, archived shows uh, and also we want to wish you all uh, happy thanksgiving we won't be on the air uh, next week and then we'll see you the week after we'll see you in two weeks Thanks for joining us. We'll see you then.